Uh, this morning, it's my pl pleasure and my privilege uh, to introduce to you our speaker, the CFO and Executive Vice President of Corporate Services at the Home Depot, Ms. Carol Tomei. You know, when I think about Carol, there are a multitude of adjectives that, that come to mind, and I think many would probably concur with that assessment, but there are two that stand out in particular, and that is selfless and active. Uh, I think that you will notice a bit of a recurring theme as I walk you through her background in just a moment as to why those are both applicable. You know, if you ever find yourself wishing the eternal wish of if I had more time, if I just had two more hours, I would be more involved in my church or I would serve on this charity, I would take a more active leadership role, and then use that wish as an excuse for why not to do so. I think Carol will make it very difficult for you to ever use that again and be able to look at yourself in the mirror with a straight face because this is a very busy person yet someone who gives tirelessly of herself uh, when asked and does so in a manner that we all quite frankly get to benefit from. Um, I got to know Carol a few years ago. Uh, Mayor Reed had asked Carol uh, would she please chair the search committee to replace the CEO for uh, the outgoing CEO at the world's busiest passenger airport, Hartsfield Jackson. This is mid-year, mid-summer, uh, not an, an overly leisurely time for, for Carol and her team. And he asked, and if any of you have been through a process like this, this is a, uh, this is a pretty significant investment of time. And she obliged willingly. And I will tell you uh, with absolute conviction that Years later, it is still as thorough, uh, as comprehensive, and as efficient of a process that I've ever been through with a search committee. But if you look at what Carol's done, and if you look at her contributions to Atlanta, to Home Depot, to the country, I think, uh, I think that's a, a pretty easy bridge to cross. Uh, Carol joined the Home Depot in 1995 and has served as its CFO since 2001. In 2007, she was named Executive Vice President of Corporate Services. Carol began her professional career as a commercial lender with the United Bank of Denver, it's now Wells Fargo, and then spent several years uh, as Director of Banking for the Johns Manville Corporation. Prior to joining the Home Depot, she was VP and Treasurer of Riverwood International Corporation. Uh, aside from her responsibilities at the Home Depot, Carol serves on the Board of Directors for uh, UPS, where she is also Chair of its Audit Committee and is a deputy chair of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta's Board of Directors. Uh, again, a firm believer in community service. Uh, Carol is an active member of the Committee of 200. Uh, she is on the board uh, for the Atlantica Botanical, Atlanta Botanical Gardens. And additionally, she has served as chair uh, for the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce in 2012. Carol has received a multitude of accolades during her years of service, uh, most notably number two on the list of uh, best CFOs in corporate America as produced by the Wall Street Journal, as well as the top 50 uh, most powerful women by Fortune magazine. I would ask that you join me this morning in welcoming to Terry, uh, our speaker, and my good friend, Carol Tomei. Well, good morning, everyone. Zach, thank you so much for that introduction. My goodness, my life passed in front of me. <laughs> thank you for that. And truly, the airport search was a, it was a success, but it was because of Zach. He did all the heavy lifting. So if you ever need to put someone on your team, call him up because he can help you source the best talent. You know, it really is a thrill for me to be here. Thank you all for coming out this morning. I just want to start by saying what a gem the University of Georgia is. Now, I went to the University of Wyoming, and when I was at Wyoming, the only, when I thought about Georgia, I thought about football. But when I moved to Georgia, I realized that the University of Georgia and the Terry College of Business produces outstanding business leaders. In fact, at the Home Depot, the finance team, we're about 700 people strong. I have 80 Terry grads working for me. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, it's awesome, including uh, uh, Tiffany Malin. I think, Tiffany, you're here this morning. so. Tiffany, where are you? Hi, so awesome. And let me just brag on Tiffany for a moment. She's in our investor relations group. And last year, Institutional Investor Magazine, do any of you read that magazine? 
Some of you do good. It's kind of a rag, but it, for, for those of us in finance, it's a cool thing. And they rate um, uh, investor relations teams. And last year, the Home Depot investor relations team ranked number one, took it all the way. So Tiffany, outstanding work. So it's, again, a thrill for me. I've got a, some re prepared remarks, but what I'd really like to do is have a dialogue with you, because I think that's the best kind of interaction, isn't it, when we get to talk to each other. So I'll start by sharing with you my point of view on the economy, housing, a little bit about our strategy, and then wrap it up with some comments about our financial results, and then I'll open it up to you, because I really want to hear from you. So first on the economy, yesterday's news was pretty big news, wasn't it? Did you expect that to happen? You did? No, certainly the market didn't. I, you know, I, I was watching our stock price yesterday, and it was down, 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 and then Chairman Bernanke came out with his announcement at 2 o'clock, and our stock price just jumped, and the whole market jumped, right, because everyone took a big sigh of relief that the Federal Reserve is not starting to ease off of quantitative easing. And I think there are probably a couple of reasons for that. First, if you look at the general economic environment, you know, the projection for GDP growth in our country this year is between 2.3 and 2.6 percent. But we only grew 1.8 percent in the first half, which means the back half of the year will be more growthy than the first half of the year. And you might say, well, why is that? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One, exports are higher than they've been, and that's good news for economic growth. Also, companies, companies like the Home Depot, we are spending more capital than we have in prior years. Our capital budget this year is $1.5 billion. That's up a couple of hundred million dollars from what we spent last year, and we're spending more in the back half than we did in the first half of the year. So the overall economy, while not robust, is growing. But that's really not what the Federal Reserve looks at. They look at two things. They look at unemployment, and they look at core inflation. And the chairman's been very, uh, uh, very opinionated about his point of view on unemployment. Until unemployment reaches around 6.5%, he's going to keep short-term rates low. That's what he said. And as you know, we're not there. We're only at about 7.3%. They also look at core inflation. They're, wanted, they're targeting around 2%. We're not at 2%. So when they looked at those factors, I think that's what gave rise to their decision yesterday. For us, we look at the overall economy. But well, we spend more time looking at housing. And the metric that we look at is private fixed residential investment. And here I'm showing you private fixed residential investment as a percent of GDP. And we have data that goes back to the 1950s. And so you can see how private fixed residential investment has performed over 60 some years. And what I will call out is when the housing bubble occurred back in 2006, private fixed residential investment stood at 6.2% of GDP. And then as you all know, we went into a recession, the greatest recession since the Great Depression. It was a housing-led recession, and you can see what happened to private fixed residential investment. It dropped. It dropped as low as about 2%. Well, we at the Home Depot, we felt it, and we felt it hard. Between 2006 and 2009, we lost $13 billion in sales. That's the equivalent of a company like Bed Bath & Beyond wiped out. Now, housing has started to recover, and so have we. Starting in 2010, our sales started to grow, and by the end of this year, we will have recaptured almost all of that $13 billion in sales loss. Now, could I just ask for a show of hands? Do any of you shop in our stores? Well, thank you, because you're helping us, so we really appreciate your business. Thank you for doing that. Now, a couple of other data points on this chart. First, you can see private fixed residential investment is growing, and that's helping grow our sales. But as of the end of the second quarter, it stood at 3.1% of GDP. Well, prior to the last recession, that's the lowest it's ever been. So I look at that from a glass half full perspective and say, hey, we've got a lot of growth ahead of us. This is good news. And then all statistics revert to the mean, right? And the mean over the past 60 some odd years is 4.6%. So we've got a long way to go till we revert back to the mean. So as we think about opportunities for growth at the Home Depot, we say, wow, we've got a lot of growth ahead of us just here in the United States as housing starts to improve. But it's not just the economic environment that's impacting our business. 
it's also our strategy. So I'd like to take a few minutes and walk you through our strategy. We have a very simple three-legged stool strategy. And if you've read Jim Collins' Good to Great, you'll recognize the construct for this strategy. Uh, the first leg of our stool is what we're passionate about. And we're passionate about customer service. The second leg of our strategy stool is what we're best in the world at. And we think we're best in the world at products for home improvement. And the third leg of our stool is what drives our economic engine. And our economic engine is driven by capital allocation, driving productivity and efficiency in our business. Now, this leg of the strategy has changed over time. You know, I started with the company back in 1995. And in 1995, we had 400 stores and revenues of about $14 billion. Today, we have over 2,250 stores. So our economic engine for a part of our history was driven by square footage growth. And we were very much like that Kevin Costner movie, Field of Dreams. It was build a store and they will come. And that's what we did. At one point, we were opening a store every 36 hours. Wow, wow. can you imagine? And I run the real estate and construction team. Can you imagine? <laughs> but we're, that's really behind us now. That's really behind us. Oh, Christy, I didn't know you were here. Hi, Christy Diaz, another Home Depot person. So great. Sorry. So anyway, that leg of the stool has changed. Now, we join the legs of the stool at the seat by what we call interconnected retail. And interconnected retail is really just leveraging our physical assets with our virtual assets. In other words, our website and our mobile applications. Because consumers are changing, and you're nodding your heads, right? How many people are shopping off your phone or shopping off a PC, right? The consumer is changing, and we have to change along with it. So just to make this real for you, let me talk a little bit about customer service. We break our customer service strategy into three major platforms, service, in stock, and store appearance. And from a service perspective, We've taught all of our associates, so we have 325,000 people working for us. We've taught all of our associates our service standard, which we call FIRST. And it's a simple acronym standing for FIND, find the customer, inquire what they're working on them, respect them, solve their problems, and then thank them. We've all been trained on FIRST. I've been trained on FIRST. All of us have been trained on FIRST. And we think it's making a difference. And I hope you're seeing that difference inside of our stores. From an in-stock perspective, we think this is a critical component of customer service. Why? If we're out of stock, you are dissatisfied. So during the recession, we transformed our supply chain, moving from a supply chain where the majority of products were shipped directly from our manufacturers to our stores. Now the majority of our products flow through what we call rapid deployment centers, their DCs. They flow to our stores, and we're able to increase our in-stock position. Our in-stocks now, they're over 99%. And then store appearance. You know, we're a working warehouse. We are. Our store is 106,000 square feet filled up with steel. They're a working warehouse, but we've got to make the store better looking, if you will. So we created merchandising execution teams. These are men and women who are responsible for the way the store looks, how the items are faced on the shelf. Also working on navigation. You know the number one question that we get from a customer? Where can I find it, right? Or where's the restroom? So we, we understand this. So our stores are hard to navigate. So what have we done? Well, if you haven't done it yet, and if you've got a smartphone, please download our Home Depot app. It's free, and if you download the app, it will localize to the store that you're shopping in, and you can bring up a store map, and you can type in where it is, and it'll show you right where it is in the store. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah, right, yeah. We, 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 I know. We, um, at the Home Depot, we actually, the officer team, we work in our stores. So we adopt a store, um, one store, one month, and we work in the store every week for that month. And it gives us a great opportunity to understand you know, the experience that our customers have from working on the floor of the store, as well as the experience that our associates have working for us. And it's a really great experience. And I certainly have been able to take those learnings back. And you may say, well, gosh, you're a finance person. Why does that matter? It matters a lot. Because if you understand the experience that your customers are going through, you can make sure that you're allocating the capital and the resources to make sure that that experience is the best experience. 
Now, from a product authority perspective, we also break our strategy down into th three major platforms. And I'll start with the bottom of this page, merchandising transformation. This is really just new tools that we're bringing into our store. Uh, imagine this. We carry about 35,000 SKUs per store, 600,000 SKUs on our website, but every store is a bit different. We need to better localize the store for the customer. We need to better not only localize from an assortment perspective, but also from a pricing perspective. And merchandising transformation is just how we talk about new tools that we are introducing to our company so we can do just that. You know, if you shop our bucket store, which is just down the street from here, it's very different customer base than a store in Moultrie, Georgia. So for most of our company, we merchandised our stores the same way. Well, that's not the future of retail. The future of retail is merchandising your store for the customer who is shopping your store. And our new tools are allowing us to do that. From a product assortment perspective, you know, we really don't sell items. We sell projects. And we have to make sure that we are bringing into our stores and our website everything you need to complete your project. So if you're painting a room, you don't just need paint. You need paint. You need rollers. You need brushers. You need tapes. You need tarp, et cetera. So we really spend a lot of time making sure that we are sorted correctly for the project. Because the last thing we want you to do is to go home and realize that, oh, rats, I forgot something and then go, go to your local Ace Hardware, which may be more convenient for you, or, heavens forbid, a company headquartered in North Carolina. <laughs> I mean, we just don't want you to do that. So we're really focused on assortment. And then portfolio strategy, of course, is just the way we talk about how we run our business from a profitability perspective. Because as you can appreciate, um, our profits are very different based on the products that we sell. We sell Appliances. We're the third largest retailer of appliances in our country. Well, appliances are fabulous, but they're very, very low margin. So if we sold appliances only, we would make very little money as a company. So we complement our appliances with, for example, oh, those brushes I talked about for painting projects. We make a lot of money on those. I probably shouldn't tell you that, but we do. So this is how we run our business, though, um, to make money, because we're in the business to make money, of course. Now, talking about interconnected retail, just to give you a little bit more color about what we mean here, we have spent and over-invested in this experience because we know we must. If we don't, we will lose. So we now have buy online, pick up and store, buy online, ship to store, buy online, return to store. We are doing everything we possibly can to bridge the experience between our stores and our, our online to make sure we have the right experience for our customers. And here's the cool thing about this. 30% of all the orders that take place on our website are picked up in our store. Isn't that awesome? It's really awesome. So we will continue to invest in this to ensure that we've got the right experience for our customers. And let me just make it real for you. Why do we care? Well, we have the number one market share in most of the categories in which we, we sell, as you would expect. So let's take a category like uh, power tools. We have about 35% market share of power tools in total. But when you go online, guess who has more market share than we online? Amazon, exactly. This is why we care. This is why we care so desperately about making sure that the experience is the right experience. So what are we doing about it? It's not just about buy online, pick up and store, buy online, return and store, et cetera. It's about working with our vendor partners. There's no better time to work with your vendor partners than when you have number one market share. So we can go to our vendor partners and say, hmm, we see that you're selling our arch competitor. We need you to stop doing that. And if you stop doing that, we will give you more volume and you will win. So manufacturers like Milwaukee and Makita, who used to sell Amazon, no longer do. They only sell us. So when we are now redefining exclusivity with our vendor partners, it's exclusivity across all channels. This is how we think we can win, not only with our store experience, but with our vendor partners. So let me then kind of wrap this up with how the numbers are looking. And the numbers are looking pretty good. So 
Last year, we set forth a target to take our operating margin to 12% and our return on invested capital to 24% by 2015. And we call this the 1224 target. Reaching these targets would make us one of the most profitable and highest returning retailers in the world. And we are well down our path of reaching of this goal. So if you look at our results for the first half of this year, you can see that we've had some nice sales growth. Our same store sales growth were up almost 8%. And in the second quarter, we had double digit positive sales. Now, this was the first time in the second quarter that we had seen that since 1999. And the second quarter was actually our best performing quarter in 21 years. If you look at earnings, our earnings are up 23%. So for the finance people in this room, that's called leverage. And that's really good leverage to have your sales up 8% and your earnings up 23%. It's a pretty good number. And inventory turns, which is part of return on invested capital, will up two tenths to 4.9 times. So we're getting more velocity with better in stocks. That's what you want. Now, I didn't talk about the third leg of our strategy stool, which is capital allocation. But let me pause and talk about that for a moment. We, as a marketing tagline, you may have seen our ads, our tagline is more saving, more doing. Well, in the finance world, our tagline is more saving, more investing. We're really focused on creating a virtual cost out loop so that we continue to take costs out of our business, which allows us to invest it back on higher returning projects. That defines who we are as an organization, this virtual cost out loop. We generate a lot of cash. As a company, we generate over $7 billion of cash every year. We take about a billion of, and a half of that and invest it back in our business. We pay 50% of our earnings in a dividend, which makes us one of the highest payout companies of any retailer. And then we take the excess cash and we buy back shares. This year we're buying back eight and a half billion dollars of our shares. We started buying back shares in 2002. To date, we've repurchased 1.1 billion shares for about 42 billion dollars in cash. So imagine that, if we hadn't purchased the shares, then we'd have 42 billion dollars of cash on our balance sheet. We'd be a lot like Apple. But we've been buying back our shares. And our average price that we bought our shares in is a little under $40. Yesterday, our stock closed over $77. So from a return on investment perspective, pretty good return. So as we look forward, we will continue to use our capital in that way to invest it back into the business, to return it to shareholders in the form of dividends, and then we'll buy back our shares. So let me just close out with this chart and probably of all the charts that I've used this is my favorite chart you know we, our company in many ways is a cult and I keep looking over and see more Home Depot people that I didn't know were here hello y'all so you know what I'm talking about we're a cult right and for all the Home Depot people if you cut us we bleed orange now part of our cult is our management construct and this is the inverted pyramid where Frank Blake our CEO his leadership team we are at the bottom of the pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid are our associates who are serving our customers. We believe in the power of this pyramid. I've been with the company for 18 years. I'm the only le senior leader who has worked for all four of our CEOs. I worked for our founders, Bernie and Arthur. I was Bob Nardelli's CFO for si six years. And now I work for Frank Blake. And I will tell you, there was a time in our company history where the inverted pyramid was turned like this. And some of you may know when that time was. I won't mention the name, but you can figure it out. Now, that's not necessarily wrong. And maybe in your companies, that kind of management pyramid works. In our company, it doesn't work. We're all about servant leadership. So when Frank Blake became the CEO, he flipped that pyramid back the way it needed to be and we started to find our way back. And part of our way back is doing the right thing by our associates, the men and women who are facing our customers every day. And let me give you a, make this real for you. During the recession, when we lost $13 billion in sales, we had to make some hard decisions. We had to close stores. We had to exit our expo business. Some of you may have shopped at ex expo. Wish you would have spent some more money there because we were losing $80 million a year, so we had to close that business. We had to make very hard decisions. 
But as we were making those decisions, we also decided to continue to invest in our people. So during the recession, where many companies were stopping merit increases or stopping making contributions into 401k plans or stopping bonuses, for our hourly associates, we didn't stop. We continued to pay merit. We continued to make contributions into 401ks, and we continued to pay our success sharing. Now, success sharing is a program that we have for our hourly associates. It's a very cool program. We reward them for doing great work and it's based off of a sales number. If they get within a certain percentage of a sales number, we pay out money to our hourly associates. For the first half of 2013, 100% of our US stores were in success sharing, and all but like a handful of our Canadian stores were in success sharing. On Sunday, we had our success sharing celebration. We paid out $137 million to those associates. Isn't that exciting for them? It's really awesome. And we're seeing it in our results. You know, it's not just us talking. We hear from 100,000 customers every week who rate us on a num number of attributes. And we roll it all up, and we look at our net promoter score. And our net promoter score is north of 70%. And we don't just listen to the customers who are shopping in our stores, because hopefully they're satisfied. We also look at survey results, like the University of Michigan survey or J.D. Powers survey, to see how we are trending. Are we doing better? We still have opportunities, for sure, but we're doing better. So I'm often asked, gosh, you're a CFO. Isn't that success sharing? Isn't that a huge expense for your company? And I say, no, it's an investment. Because I believe in what Bernie Marcus said. And Bernie Marcus said, if you take care of your associates, they'll take care of the customers, and the rest will take care of itself. Believe it to my heart. The other aspect of our business and why we're a cult our values. We have eight core values, and these are values that we wear on our aprons, but it's, we bring them to life. We bring them to life every day by trying to live the values. And when you employ over 300,000 people, for sure, it's the equivalent of a small town or a big small city, I should say, we're going to have some bad apples, and when we find them, we have to deal with it. But generally speaking, our people are people who reflect these core values. And I won't walk through the entire value will, but maybe comment on, on a few. Uh, one, entrepreneurial spirit. You might ask, wait, you're an $80 billion company? By definition, you can't be entrepreneurial. You must be just one bureaucratic behemoth. Well, the truth is bureaucracy creeps in every day, and we do our best to try to smash it, get rid of it, because bureaucracy can kill companies. So we try every day to be nimble, to look around corners, to anticipate where the customer is going, because the retail landscape is littered with companies who have gone away because they didn't do that. Think about Circuit City. Think about Borders. Think about what's happening at Sears, what's happening at JCPenney. Retailers go away if they don't stay nimble, quick, in tune with the customer. So every day, we try to keep that entrepreneurial spirit alive. The other value that I'll mention is giving back. We're very proud of our community efforts. And the reason why I wanted to comment on it now is that we're in the midst of celebration of service. Between September 11th and Veterans Day, we will do 300 community projects across the country in celebration of our foundation's mission, which is providing affordable living for our veterans. We've committed $80 million to that cause. We spent about $55 million against that. And it is such a joy for us to be able to give back, not only of our dollars, but of our sweat equity to our communities. I worked on a project earlier this week, and it's just awesome. In you know, southeast uh, Atlanta, we're building a community garden that will service veterans as well as the community at large. And it's just a, it's just a cool thing. And let me tell you, it takes a whole lot of people to do something like that. We had 200 people on site because it's a really big garden. So that's another value that I wanted to share with you. Um, Zach, you were kind to ask me to come here today. You know, for me, this is my way to give back a little bit. I hope it's been worth your while, and I really would like to take your questions. So we can talk about anything. And it is webcast, I think, uh, Dean. So we have to wait for a mic, perhaps. Is that right? You'll give them the directions. No, that, that's fine. Uh, Carol is going to take questions. And uh, raise your hand, and please wait for a mic, because we're live on a 
webcast, so we need to be able to hear you. So, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a most enlightening and enlivening talk. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about your international future. I know you've had some blips on the road on that, especially in South America and China. Uh, what does the future hold there? Yes, so the question is about our international business. Uh, we are the number one player in Canada and Mexico, and you're spot on. Our experience in other parts of the globe have not been so successful. So we did go into Chile and Argentina. That venture did not work for lots of reasons. While you can see a growing middle class in the countries, it's very, very hard to do business there. And we exited that business, and that was the right decision. We went into China in 2006 with a 12-store acquisition, and we did everything wrong in China. Uh, Kelly Barrett, who is our chief audit executive, she can tell you the horror stories. I mean, doing business, have, do any of you do business in China? It's hard. It's really hard. It's a communist country, for heaven's sakes. But we did things wrong, too. We had the wrong business model. You know, the Chinese don't do it themselves. We couldn't break through two and three step distribution, so we made no money. And it, it, it was just, we made no money. And so I kept talking to our CEO, Frank Blake, about it. I'm like, you know, we should shut this down. We should shut this down. It's not making any money. He's like, we're not going to shut it down, and you're going to fix it. So he gave me the retail business. I'm like, oh, great. And so started to really take it apart and said, no, this business model will not work. And we sadly had to reach the decision to close those stores. But what we did do is we started a new business in China. And this is a standalone paint business. So we opened up about a 1,200 square foot store with our private brand paint, paint that's manufactured in the United States and sent to China. We were actually, after one year, making money in that business. But here's the sad thing. We looked at how big it could be in China. And while you think of China as this enormous country with an enormous economy, not so much in our space. So as we modeled it out, we realized it would take us about 10 years to get to $100 million in sales. $100 million in sales for our company? We can bring one SKU into the United States and get $100 million in one year. So we proved to ourselves that we can make, misses, or make money, but we're exiting. We're exiting China. We'll keep our sourcing office there. So then we've, you know, we've studied the rest of the world. Western Europe, you don't really want to go to a, countries like Italy where more people are dying than being born. So we don't see opportunities in Western Europe. The economy's been down seven quarters in a row. It's heavily overstored from a home improvement market. Eastern Europe, same thing. We don't see opportunities there. Asia, we've said no, can't size the price. It's not big enough. We're just going to really focus on where we are. The home improvement market in the United States is $300 billion. There are so many sales to go get right here in this country. We can make a lot more money doing that, and that's a good thing for our shareholders. So that's what we're going to be doing. Hey, Carol, could you comment on the Affordable Care Act and its impact on a retailer? Well, the Affordable Care Act impacts all large employers, so obviously we're no exception. Um, I'll tell you this about the Affordable Care Act. We're not going to let a change in law impact doing the right thing for our customers or our associates. So we will continue to staff our stores to meet the needs of our customers, and we will continue to provide benefits for our people. Good morning. Thanks for coming. I actually uh, spent 10 years in big box retail at Best Buy, so I can appreciate all the things you're speaking about. Oh. Um, so well, they seem to have found their way. You know, they were really losing it for a while, but it appears. Well, I, I think it's to your point about making sure you're agile and investing yeah. in too much real estate and yeah. integrating the online experience. So, again, I could really relate to what you were saying. Uh, but my question is actually about, because, you know, I know we're all football fans here. But I recently read an article um, about how so many brands are drooling over the ESPN game day experience and how Home Depot has such a strong presence there. So I'm curious, you know, along with game day and other sort of marketing ventures, I know there's, I think, uh, in California or Texas, you guys sponsor a stadium. 
you know, how have you benefited from those types of investments um, and, and the expansion of your brand? Well, the truth is, with the exception of ESPN Game Day, our sports marketing has a negative ROI. Um, and so we are actually moving a, more and more away from that, with the exception of game day. There's something really miraculous about that. <laughs> and so we are really committed to that. We love that. But most of our marketing dollars, I mean, marketing, for marketers in the room, wow, you're going through changes. Wow. You know, if you think about how we used to spend our marketing dollars and how we do now, we are way over tilting to digital, moving away from paper. You know, we grew up. We grew up with our flyer that was printed every Wednesday, and you'd walk the stores with the circular. Are we set for the offer? Yeah, it's all going away. All going away. And it's moving digital and radio, because there's a higher return for us on radio than TV. And TV is moving away from you know, the, the uh, CBS and ABCs of the world to more uh, Hulus of the world. So things are really changing. We, we use. Uh, uh, marketing analysis to get to determine where we get the best return on on our investment. It's very analytical. It's really scientific. It's the best way to describe it. Where marketing for so many of us was just sort of an emotional, right? And it's a, a feeling. It's becoming really an, a, a science and not an art. I'm here to talk about anything, but it seems like the questions may be waning. Yes, sir. You, uh, you better wait for the mic. Okay. Thank you. Um, you've talked a lot about the in-store experience, but talk a little bit more about the out-of-store experience and your online presence. Do you plan to battle Amazon online or convince the customer that it's better to be in the store than to get that product online? We're making a lot of investments um, for our online experience to make sure it's the right experience for the customer. We, Amazon is a fabulous item retailer, but there is no experience other than they've got a great checkout experience. With us, you don't come to the Home Depot for an item necessarily. You come because you need something. You've got something that's not working in your house, or you've got an idea that you want to do a kitchen remodel or a bathroom model, you want to build a basement. You don't go to Amazon for that. You come to us for that. So that's the experience that we want you to have online. You can get it in the store, but we want you to have that experience online. So all of our how-to videos, how to fix a leaky faucet, how to install a, a toilet, all those things you think, I can do this myself if just someone would help me, they're all posted to our website. They're also all posted to YouTube. Because we're not going to force the customers to be in a closed community. We're going to get the media out there the way the customers want the media. And, as, and people will think, oh, Home Depot, Home Depot, you know, I, I think I'll go to Home Depot. But they may easily go to YouTube for that same piece of information. So we're posting it all out, getting that experience, then tying it back to our stores, um, looking at solving the last mile delivery. You know, we're building direct fulfillment facilities that will be part, and, and, and you're, Jenny, you're working on this, aren't you, and helping us develop learning materials for this. These direct fulfillment facilities will be ways of getting product that's ordered online more efficiently delivered to our customers. But then I think about, gosh, we've got almost 2,000 points of delivery in this country with our stores. So why not leverage that? Amazon doesn't have that. Now they're building out distribution facilities. We've got them today. All we have to work on is routing, and we could solve that last mile. And for those of us who buy big, bulky products like washers and dryers, or uh, riding lawnmowers, or barbecue grills, and we've got small cars, and say, well, I need to get this home, wouldn't it be great to have the Home Depot just get it home for you? And then, oh, by the way, when it gets home to you, what about put it together for you? And, oh, by the way, haul away your old stuff. Right? So this, Amazon's not doing any of that stuff. This is how we can make an experience that's a sticky experience. Yes? What kind of return do you see or feedback or, or con contribution to the experience of your in-store how-tos as opposed to watch it on YouTube, you come down to the store and learn how to install tile or whatever? So we have these wonderful uh, workshop programs, um, both for DIYers at large, but also we've got do-it-herself workshops. I don't know if you've ever done them. They're a uh, gas. They're a lot of fun. And we get a tremendous amount of positive uh, 
feedback off of those workshops. Um, we're also working on how to make the stores more of a, just a, a, a place of entertainment, so where you can actually try out products. You know, that's a cool thing, is you can try it before you buy it, so you can see that happen in some of our stores on the weekends. We'll actually have demos and places that you can try, because that's, you know, it's, we live in an experience economy. You want to experience it. You don't want to just shop. And I think that's why, you know, when we lost our way for a while, when our customer service, you know, where we lost our way, the customer reaction was really violent because customers have come to know us as a place for an experience, a place where they really like to shop, where they like to talk to our associates. And, you know, you don't have that same emotional attack uh, to most stores, right? I mean, if you go to one Publix or another, do you really, you know, it's, right? It's not really an attachment, but you come to our stores and you're, you get really attached to what you're working on. So that's why uh, we've got to continue to focus on that experience. Well, let's see. Just, oh, a, here, uh, yeah, just a, qu a quick question. Uh, you've shared a lot. We really, really enjoyed the presentation. Oh, From uh, anticipation for other challenges that you see, can you share with us just some things that you know, may keep you up at night or just some of the challenges that you're anticipating for the, for the future? Sure. In a recovering environment, competition is invited in. So what do we do to stay focused on our business to make the competition irrelevant? It's very easy to get sidetracked to say, ah, so-and-so just opened up a new lumber yard, or oh, so-and-so just opened up a new store, and like kind of get focused on that without losing sight on where you need to go. This is a real, just, just requires discipline to stay focused on where you're taking the company and make the competition irrelevant. But they are coming in. So if you look like uh, companies like Lumber Liquidators, they're having very good results. And so some of our folks will say, we've got to go kill them. And we're like, don't, don't, no. What you need to do is to have the best flooring offer possible for your customer base, not worry about them. So I would say that's certainly one thing that keeps me up at night. I would say, you know, the, the global economy is not good. And, and we have to be wary of that and, and aware of that and understand that it could have implications to what happens here. And what happens here could have implications to the global economy because the world is flat. You know, we source about 11% of our products from outside the United States. So it matters to us what's happening outside the United States. So always, you know, watching world trends and figuring out what disruptions could come our way if things were to go really sideways in, in parts of the globe. I think from a risk perspective, you know, Kelly Barrett, our chief audit executive is here. From a risk perspective, I think we are all concerned about cybersecurity, attacks coming in, protecting our customer data, um, our proprietary pricing information. Uh, so are our IT systems where they need to be? Do we have the right detection and protection in place? So those kinds of things from a risk perspective, of, of course, keep me up. Probably the other thing, I'm speaking very candidly, is complacency. You know, I, I've been, again, with the company a long time. In 1999, we had a really great year. We had pos positive double-digit comps. Our stock was trading at a 70 multiple, 70 multiple, and we were feeling really good, really good. Fast forward 10 months to October of 2000, we had our first earnings warning ever in our company history and the stock sold off about 25% that day. And I will never forget it because I'm sitting in Arthur Blank's office on the phone with our largest shareholder who was Fidelity at the time and they are screaming, screaming at him. And I had my head in my hand and my other hand on his desk because they are just screaming. And he reached over and patted my hand. It was the most generous, kind gesture he could have done because I, you know, I'm like, I'm going to lose my job. So they're screaming at us. <laughs> the, and, and really, I think it's because we got complacent. And shortly thereafter, we had a new CEO. So when I talk to our leadership team, I say we have got to fight against complacency because here we are now. We're feeling good. And we're feeling really good. Not only are we growing our sales, we are beating the pants off of our competition in North Carolina, and our stock is trading at a record high. So we are feeling really good. And if we lose that competitive edge, if we start feeling really good, 
we can get into so much trouble so fast. So we just every day have got to wake up saying this is a battle, it's a battle, we've got to fight every day, we've got to focus on the customer, focus on our strategy, and hopefully continue to do the right thing. So I'm looking at the clock, and I, I know you want to finish up here soon, so maybe one more question? Would that be all right, if there is another question? The earlier conversation about Amazon and Best Buy got me thinking about showrooming, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the term. Does Home Depot experience much about, uh, of that, and if so, what are you doing to combat it? All you have to do is go into our store, and you can see people with their smartphones, you know, taking pictures of the products that we sell, going to Google Shop or whatever channel that they use to do showrooming, of course we do. So what do we do about it? A number of things. We acquired a company last year in Austin, Texas called Black Locus. And Black Locus is a, is a big data company that does price scraping for us. So we are constantly scraping prices of comp competition, both online and in-store competition, and comparing those retail prices against ours. There are some products in the store that we will not be beat. So we will make sure that we have the lowest price. There are other products that we sell in the store that we're not going to care about so much. Like we sell liquid water and Coke in our store. That, we're not top of mind for that. So if somebody's cheaper than us, they're going to be cheaper than us. It's a convenience. So we are, we are very focused on pricing. The other thing that we're focused on is proprietary brands. You can't show room for a, a proprietary brand. And we've got outstanding brands. If you think of Husky. Hampton Bay, Glacier, uh, Glacier Bay, and the list goes on. We've introduced a new uh, private brand last year called HDX. If you haven't purchased an HDX product, I would encourage you to try it out. We brought it into cleaning. The quality is better than anything you could find at a comparable price point, and it's really good stuff. Try it out. We love this. We brought it in last year. We're on track to be $700 million on our way to a billion dollars in two years. You can't showroom that. So it's a combination of things that we're doing to stay competitive. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much. Nope. Thank stay here. Stay here. Oh. Oh. <laughs>